This morning we are going into our Old Testament for our scripture lesson today, and that can be found from the book of Song of Songs, page one, or 1050 and 1051. We will be reading chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. Listen to the word of the Lord as it is read. I am a rose of Sharon, a lily of the valleys. Like a lily among the thorns is my darling among the maidens. Like an apple tree among the trees of the forest is my lover among the young men. I delight to sit in his shade, and his fruit is sweet to my taste. He has taken me to the banquet hall. And his banner over me is love. Strengthen me with raisins. Refresh me with apples. For I am faint with love. His left arm is under my head. His right arm embraces me. Daughters of Jerusalem, I charge you by the gazelles and by the does of the field. Do not arouse or awaken love until it so desires. Listen, my lover, look, he comes leaping across the mountains, bounding over the hills. My lover is like a gazelle or a young stag. Look, there he stands behind the walls, gazing through the windows, peering through the lattice. My lover spoke and said to me, Arise, my darling, my beautiful one, and come with me. See, the winter is past. The rains are over and gone. Flowers appear on the earth. The season of singing has come. The cooing of doves is heard in our land. The fig tree forms its early fruit. The blossoming vines spread their fragrance. Arise, come, my darling, my beautiful one. Come with me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Those of you who have already read your River's Edge Echo know that the rest of the month of February, I will be preaching on books of the Bible that I have not yet preached on during my tenure here in Saratoga. I chose to preach on the Song of Songs this morning because it is a dialogue between two lovers, and I felt with Valentine's Day being this Friday, gentlemen, don't forget to buy your uh, wives a Valentine's gift or a uh, there's no help I can provide you if you forget that day. But I felt with Valentine's Day being this Friday, what a better time to <coughs> preach from this book. As I was working on this sermon this past week, I could not help but reflect about the responses I saw on social media regarding the halftime show at last week's Super Bowl. A significant number of people were upset by the performance. Some of them went online and equated the show with a strip tease act. I also found yesterday morning when I opened up my news feed that there is a Ohio Baptist minister who has even declared that he is going to sue at least the NFL Pepsi, and maybe even his local uh, cable company for not putting a disclaimer before the show warning him about how offensive the halftime show will be. I sure hope whoever his attorney is, it's charging by the hour and not on a contingency fee because I, as much as I did not like the halftime show, even I know he doesn't have a good case at all. But just like there were a number of people 
who were unhappy with the halftime show last week. There were many people who were against including the Song of Songs into the Old Testament scripture. Those who were against it have the following arguments as to why it should not have been included. First, if you read the entire Song of Songs, you will not find any overt reference to God. You also will not find any prayers in Song of Songs. Furthermore, there are no instructions on theology or religious practices. And then finally, this book borders on what one commentator I read calls soft porn. If I went to First and Bridge Street one day and just captured people as they were walking by and said, let me read you a line and see if you know where it's from. And I read, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. And then ask the people, where is this line found? How many people would guess the Bible? And yet, that is the very first line of the book of Psalms, except for a little uh, notation that this was a song of Solomon. With all of this going against this book, how did it happen to get into our canon? The main reason why it was ever included into the Old Testament was that it had a very influential rabbi supporting it. Those who supported its inclusion said that this poetry pointed to a love story between Yahweh, the sacred name of God that the Hebrews would never pronounce, and Israel. In the Christian community, we see this as a love story between God and us Christians. In this story, we can see the repairing of the damage done by the original sin. We see a reversal from being alienated from God because of our sin to being restored to the status of beloved of God. Even though this book was adopted into scriptures, many rabbis realized just how racy this portion of scripture was and gave the instruction that no one under the age of 30 should ever read this book. Thank God we have a Sunday school program so we have the under 30 crowd out of the room today. The first verse of chapter 2 in the Hebrew has <coughs> different ways that it could be translated. Almost all of the English translations read, I am a rose of Sharon. However, roses were not a uh, flower that bloomed in the Holy Land at that time. And you could also read the Hebrew as being, I am a crocus, which was a family of plants that were very bountiful in the region at that time. <coughs> Seeing verse 1 in this alternate reading would also have the maiden declaring that she was just an ordinary person, nothing special. While translating the exact wording may be difficult, understanding what is being conveyed here really isn't that difficult. Biblical scholars have pointed out that this same te or terminology what the English translates as a rose of Sharon, is also used in the prophecies of Isaiah and Hosea. And the, in those prophecies, the term was used to assure the people that after a time of God's punishment, there would be a time of restoration and beauty. In verse 1 of today's passage, we see a reference to the restoration mentioned previously by the two books of the 
of prophecy. If we decide to go with the alternative reading and envision this as the beloved saying that she is nothing special, that helps us see verse 2 in an uplifting <laughs> light. We can see verse 2 as a line spoken by the lover, and remember the lover here is God. We see in God's reply a rejection of us, the beloved, being just ordinary. In God's sight, we are like a beautiful lily amongst the bramble of thorns. We are special in God's sight. The rest of this morning's passage is spoken by the beloved. She starts off by declaring her lover to be an apple tree among the forest of trees. The forest of trees, of course, would be the other young men in the area. Obviously, apple trees do not normally grow in wild forests. forests. And in saying that her lover is an apple tree in the forest, the beloved is pointing out the uniqueness of her lover. She continues to declare that she delights in sitting in his shade and his fruit is sweet to the taste. Now, if the NFL should happen to invite me to design next year's halftime uh, Super Bowl program, which I would do for far less than what it cost the NFL this year, and I chose to base it on the dramatization of this scripture passage, this, at verse 3, is where I might need to flash a warning that the young children might need to be escorted out of the room. After all, as I was working on this this week, I couldn't help but think, what would happen if I just happened to be invited to one of the English classes at the middle high school this week and read from, and read from verse 3? And what I would do is I would tell the students that in light of Valentine's coming up, I'm going to read from a classical love poem and then read verse 3 to them. When I ask them what do they think the uh, speaker meant when she says, I delight to sit in his shade. His fruit is sweet to my taste. Uh, some of those students' responses might border on the risque. And I know if I was in the Bay Area, it would definitely be R-rated what they would come up with. Moving to verse 4, the Beloved talks about being taken to a banquet hall. The original readers of this poem would easily see this banquet hall being a love feast, being hosted by the lover with the Beloved being the guest of honor. This would further, this is further enforced by the addition that the banner hanging over the beloved is love. Clearly, the beloved is deeply in love with her lover. Just as there is a strong attachment of love between the two lovers in this story, we should have the same love for God as the Beloved has for her lover. In verse 5, we start to see the Beloved asking to be strengthened with apples and raisins. Both of these fruit in biblical times were considered to be aphrodisiacs. She needs to be refreshed because she is falling faint in love. Just like the Beloved, we need to be constantly asking God to refresh us as well. She continues her demonstration of love 
demonstrated to her by mentioning how her lover's left arm is under her head and his right arm embraces her. Once again, imagine how this would play out on a TV show or a stage. Definitely, this would not be a friend, family friendly scene right here. We, as well as the la lady here, need to develop a deep relationship with God. Oh, excuse me, I skipped a section. I'll go back to it. As we get to verse 7, we see a commercial break taking place. For the first time, we see the mention of the daughters of Jerusalem. No matter how hard I have searched, there is nobody who has given a definitive answer as to just who these daughters of Jerusalem were. However, the Beloved is issuing a warning to them to let love take its natural course. True love really does take time. The Beloved is <laughs> warning her younger ladies not to try to speed up love or slow down the path that love takes. In this warning, we see a word of wisdom to us as well. If we, have a, if we want to have a deep love and a deep relationship with God, we need to take the time to nurture it. We need to be spending time building our relationship with God. We build that relationship by meditating on God's Word and spending time daily with the Almighty in prayer. Just as two lovers try to spend as much time as possible with each other, we should be looking forward to those opportunities when we can spend time with God. In verses 8 through 10, we see the lover as a gazelle or a young stag. One thing that the English can't catch here is the wordplay going on by choosing the lover to be a gazelle. In the Hebrew language, gazelles, the gazelle uses the same consonants as the word El Shaddai, one of the terms for God. So here the poet is playing off of the word El Shaddai and comparing El Shaddai to a gazelle. He is coming to his beloved, bounding over the mountains and hills. The lover is looking out from the lover is looking from outside the re residence where his beloved is staying. He is peeking in from behind the lattice. She is peering out from her residence, looking through a window. She then tells us that her lover is calling her to come out and join him. Behind the wall, the woman is safe. The lover wants her to come out and join him, but that requires that she trusts him to protect her. The lover tells her of all the beauty that awaits her if she joins him. But in order to see the beauty, she is going to have to step out and take the risk that is involved in leaving the security of her residence. Brothers and sisters in Christ, I believe God is challenging us to do the same thing that the lover is challenging the beloved. God is standing outside the walls of comfort that we have built. He is calling us to come out and to play with Him. Granted, 
Stepping out behind the walls of safety and joining God is going to take some risk. It requires us to step out in faith. But as we see in verses 11 through 13, there is a beauty to behold if we take the risk and step out in faith. When I was a child, Ultra Bright toothpaste, and I don't even think Ultra Bright's around anymore, but Ultra Bright toothpaste has a, had a campaign slogan where they would have the audacity to ask, how's your love life? Most of the people would giggle, just like I heard some of you giggle just now. However, there would always be this one person who would, act, who would respond, it's rated G. Bring the kids, bring the dog, bring grandma also. In other words, he really did not have a love life. This morning, we might want to ask the same question. How is our love life with God going? Is it exciting? Is it boring? Does it even exist? We have a God who deeply loves us. He invites us to join him at his banquet table. He supports and he embraces us. His banner over us indeed is love. He is standing outside our walls, inviting us to take the risk and come follow him. The question is, are we going to return the love that he has given us back to him? Or are we going to play it safe and stay within the confines of the four walls that we have built and miss all of the beauty that he has planned for us? Are we going to take the, make the effort <coughs> it takes to stoke the fires of love that we had at one time towards God? Are we going to set aside some time daily to study and to meditate on God's Word? Let us indeed take up His invitation to come out and play with Him. Let us step out in faith and obey His calling. Let us have an exciting and, yes, even a risque love affair with God. Amen. Now I would invite you to stand if you are able and sing Take Time to Be Holy, page 457 in the Red Hymn.